Well, thank you. And thank you, Heather. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And of course, what, to, what we're doing today is celebrating uh, Charles Darwin. Um, most of you probably know Darwin was born on the very same day as, uh, uh, as Abraham Lincoln uh, in 1809 uh, on uh, February 12th. So that became Lincoln's birthday that we celebrated when I was a kid. We had two holidays, two, uh, we had uh, Lincoln's birthday on the 12th of February and Washington's birthday on the 22nd. Uh, those guys got together and decided they'd celebrate together on the 20th. And uh, that left the 12th open so that Darwin could celebrate by himself. And uh, that's why we're doing it on the 5th. Uh, what are fossils? Uh, I had to try and figure this out, you see. Um, and uh, let's see if we, okay, we're fine. What are fossils? And uh, are they mineral replicas of once living organisms? Or are they, do they have to be extinct? Uh, well, some, many of them are, but they don't have to be. Older than 10,000 years? Well, that's a silly cutoff. In fact, these definitions are all pretty silly. Uh, I say, first of all, they pretty much have to be dead and uh, quite old. Uh, actually, I think even better definition would be anything that paleontologists find particularly interesting. And uh, uh, not only that, it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to have body fossils involved here. Uh, we're also talking about anything, any uh, sedimentary structure or anything else that happens to shed light on ancient organisms. So that's what fossils are. Now, my love for fossils goes back a long way. Um, Here's, the, I don't know if, yeah, okay, I can guess I can see it. Doesn't matter. You can't see what it looks like. You see it on the screen. But uh, this was my introduction to geology and specifically paleontology. Dad brought this in from Uncle Joe's field and showed me and uh, tried to explain you know, why these shells were in, you know, in the, uh, embedded or impressed into the little mudstone pebble that I am showing you here. And um, and well, I thought this was fascinating. I was five or six years old at the time, and uh, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, but he couldn't quite he couldn't quite explain to me uh, how they got pressed into this uh, solid rock. Of course, the rock was made much after the impression was made. Well, this is a fossil, even though the organism isn't here anymore. It's a, it's the impression. Well, we'll go on. You'll you'll see as we as we go along. I think first of all, you'll see how much. I really love fossils, even though I'm not a paleontologist. I'm a sedimentologist. I study sand and stuff like that. But um, the um, you, you you'll see that there that uh, the things that are regard worth talking about when fossils are much more than just uh, dead organisms. Well, this uh, I, this statement, this uh, love for fossils and so forth, and my dad was very accommodating. He would uh, basically take me places that I wanted to go. I had a whole library of, of uh, publications from state, geolog state geological surveys and so forth, uh, you know, starting in grade school. And uh, so I knew a lot of places, good places to go. I was also lucky in choosing my parents because they, uh, a dad wasn't a geologist or a scientist at all. He was a, an elementary school principal, but he liked interesting things. And, uh, you know, I, I had the good fortune to grow up in Jersey City, right across the Hudson River from New York City. And uh, frequently, you know, on Saturdays, we'd say, what are we going to do today? Well, we could go to the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, or we could go to uh, uh, the Bronx Zoo. I loved all those places, but my favorite was this one, the uh, Museum of Natural History, American Museum of Natural History. And I used to dream about getting locked inside that place. Um, okay. I was particularly, uh, uh, I like the, the third floor, all the floors. I mean, the place is great. I, from one end to the other, the dioramas, all kinds of things. And uh, I recommend it to anybody who hasn't been there. But um, I especially liked the third floor. Mom wasn't terribly interested in that, but I liked it because I like reptiles and amphibians. So uh, that was third floor and fourth floor was dinosaurs. And they were the very best. This is what it used to look like. They've redone the dinosaur hall since my youth, uh, but then, you know, they're much improved in many ways, but uh, you know, you have a fondness or, for the way things used to be. 
I just like when you go back as an alum, you, you don't care about their new programs. You just want to see if your dirty coffee cup is still in the bottom drawer or someplace. Um, and uh, okay, well, this is some of the you know, Cretaceous dinosaurs and so forth. All right, but what really fascinated me um, was the fifth floor of the museum. Now that was closed to the public, but um, that's where uh, the uh, curator's offices were and so forth. I guess this, I don't know how much of this shows, but the curator's offices and research collections and so forth were on the fifth floor. And uh, turns out that, you know, by, by I've been up there five, uh, three times uh, now. Uh, the first time was when I was in the eighth grade and Okay. <laughs> anyway, these filaments basically are just heavily coated with calcium carbonate, and uh, this is a very recent fossil, but uh, that's uh, that's enough of that thing. Okay, my second uh, visit to the fifth floor of the, of the Museum of Natural History was uh, when I, I, my dad and I, while I was in college, actually, uh, were uh, collecting from a, uh, a an abandoned, an old quarry uh, a little bit north of uh, Jersey City on the backside of the Palisade Sill. And um, in a shale unit there, I collected a number of fish. I took this one over and the uh, cur curator immediately recognized it as the Pleurus. And uh, that's a coelacanth, actually. You may have heard of them. This is an ancient one. This one is more than about 200 million years old. Um, and uh, the reason that he knew so much about it was I, this was about three, three years after he had published uh, uh, the uh, classic article on this particular fish, which was interesting because he asked me, he really wanted me, he liked the fish, the specimen. And in fact, he wanted me to leave it at the museum, but I declined and instead it's in our basement. But uh, <laughs> anyway, no, but seriously, I mean, he's, a, he's an important uh, a source for this kind of information. If you Google and go, go to uh, Wikipedia and uh, you know ask for Deplorus, the only reference in the article, fairly long article about it, is uh, by uh, Bob Schaefer, who was the guy that uh, I was that talking thing? to. I'm sorry. How long is that? Thing? Not very long, only about six inches, something like that. Yeah. Uh, Triassic age, if that means anything to anybody. I had the good fortune to go to Antioch College. Most of my, I have, I've had an awful lot of good fortune in my life, but this was one of them. I kind of fell into it uh, in southwestern Ohio. And one of their signature program was a uh, work study program where uh, half of each year, for six months of each year, uh, a student would be off the campus working on some job somewhere, usually in his field. And uh, my first job, again, I like museums. My first, not my first job, but one of my uh, four jobs was um, at the uh, the uh, Philadelphia Academy of uh, Academy. What is it? Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. And uh, I was working for a uh, specialist in fossil clams. But anyway, while I was there, I did a lot of different things. But one of the things they were, they were uh, this artist, uh, Jonathan Fairbanks, was doing a big mural at the end of the dinosaur hall. And uh, I uh, got to be friends with also to help them out a little bit. For example, before he, uh, uh, before he did the painting here, he did a rough sketch of what he, the way that, that uh, uh, dinosaur, the standing dinosaur, what he thought it should look like. And this was a pencil sketch on a large piece of uh, craft paper. Well, okay, so what did I do? I, my, my contribution was that I took that piece of craft paper with its dinosaur on it, uh, on the train from Philadelphia to New York, to my famous museum, the Museum of Natural History in New York, to the fifth floor by prearrangement. And, uh, uh, and uh, spoke to uh, Edwin H. Colbert. Some of you uh, may have heard the name before because he was the world specialist, uh, you know, in uh, you know, really in, in dinosaurs. So basically, I showed it to him, and he looked at it sagely and rocked his head a little bit, and things like you know, like uh, uh, paleontologists are supposed to do. And uh, he took an eraser and you know, erased a little bit around the back the neck and sketched in some pencil lines and did a few things. But anyway, so uh, that was fun. But then what was really fun was what happened next. Uh, his assistant and I went down to the uh, exhibit hall of Cretaceous dinosaurs. And um, while, you know, 
people wandering through it. <laughs> Most of them actually kind of gathered around to see what we were doing. Uh, we opened this large glass case uh, and uh, with the help of a, a step ladder and a, um, and a um, uh, well, I guess we were using a, uh, I don't know if we used a yardstick or a, what but anyway but anyway we're measuring the different dimensions of the from key point to key point so that we get the proportions right um well i'll ask this question now and again while we're going through this until you're tired of it uh you know what good are fossils and for one thing they're beautiful i think this is a work of art this this display there i just love it and uh so i find them beautiful they also, they tell us that about creatures we'd otherwise never have known existed. There is absolutely no way we would know that dinosaurs ever existed or trilobites or any other extinct organisms. We would not know uh, that they'd existed without fossils. Now, like I say, I can, I can uh, wax sort of quite uh, enthusiastic and romantically about fossils. Uh, for example, this uh, bone here that you see on the screen, I hope. Um, <laughs> I see this. This is not a manufactured item. It's not something they pound out by the, you know, the dozens and hundreds and thousands. Uh, this was a particular, this wasn't even a generic dinosaur. It was an individual dinosaur. An individual dinosaur, and, and most of his bone material is actually still here. I'm touching it. But a, a, an individual dinosaur that ran around doing dinosaur things, eating dinosaur food, having dinosaur sex, and, uh, and basically trying to stay out of the reach of, of T-Rex. So, um, like I say, what are the chances, <laughs> you know, that this poor guy would have imagined that 70 million years later, I'd be waving this his forearm bone uh, to a, a, a bunch of humanists. Not, not very great, I think. <laughs> What's that? He might take a bite of you. <laughs> no, he was a, an herbivore. This probably belonged to a dinosaur similar to the one that I was just talking about, the one that was in the exhibit. Okay, so how do you find fossils? You dig. Well, sometimes you do dig. These guys are digging for fossils. And uh, there's Neil Shubin, University of Chicago, and Ted Deschler, Academy of Natural Sciences, Philadelphia. Remember, I worked there 60 years earlier. And um, they're, they're digging there. Why did they find? Well, they thought it'd be a convenient place to dig, uh, <laughs> namely on Ellesmere Island, uh, up uh, 700 miles north of the Arctic Circle. That's where you go see to dig for fossils. Well, obviously they had reasons for digging there. And the reason was that uh, they knew that the rocks in that area were of, a, of an appropriate, uh, the sedimentary rocks there were of an appropriate age for what they were looking for. And uh, they had been deposited, sandstones and shales had been deposited in an environment, an ancient environment that uh, was suitable for the kinds of things they were looking for. So what were they looking for? They were interested in transition between uh, between ancient fish and uh, and uh, amphibians. That was a key key moment in in Earth's history, and it belongs. You see here, you've got the fish and you've got the uh, amphibians, and this happened about in the late uh, late Devonian. Well, they were hoping to fill in that gap, and they had they had paid her. Uh, they came up with a an, an, uh, an animal. Actually, it's a fish, barely, that. Um, uh, was uh, exactly the uh, the intermediate that they wanted. Uh, since I had worked at the academy and I visited occasionally uh, uh, since then, the um, I, I spent a a morning with Ted Deschler because, well, his office actually is uh, was is about uh, thirty feet away across the room from where I had my little desk set up with a typewriter in those days as I say, 60 years earlier. But anyway, he led me around, he showed me around uh, that morning, showed me the specimens they were dealing with. This is the type specimen, the one that actually defines this, the species. And um, it's, it's really beautiful. I know it looks like a train wreck, but uh, it's, uh, it, really, uh, it really is a beautiful, uh, um, a beautiful uh, specimen. Yeah. How do you pronounce the name? Tiktaalik. Okay. Yeah. Um, the um, question was, how do you pronounce the name? 
the uh, uh, this specimen was really beautiful, but, but actually at the time I visited, it was still in preparation. That is to say, the preparator was uh, removing uh, the excess uh, stones and so the matrix around the the specimen and uh, around this specimen. And actually, I got to hold the thing with some trepidation. So I, I've I've left some of my DNA on the type specimen of this classic world famous animal that lived at the transition between fish and amphibian back in late Devonian time. Uh, but uh, Tiktaalik was important for a whole bunch of reasons. For example, uh, here you see that in the limb bone, these are not things that you expect to see in a fish, uh, but uh, you know, the humerus, radius, and all of these are, are the same bones that we have that you know all our vertebrate friends have, the uh, mammals and so forth. And uh, but fish don't have wrists. Uh, this guy had wrists. Some of those bones there are, are wrist bones. And uh, they still had fin rays and so forth. This guy probably could not uh, get out of the water very much, maybe a little like a, a, a mud skipper, you know, flop around a little bit right near the water and then go back in. But he was a fish, but he was barely a fish. He was turning into basically becoming transitional to amphibian. And uh, uh, again, the the amazing thing is that these things we're using tools now that were not known to Charles Darwin. The uh, you know th these are uh, this is a CT scan, and not only that, but with the wonders of computers that from people who know how to operate them, uh, they <laughs> uh, you know can do all kinds of fancy things. But this is the limb of the specimen that you just uh, you just saw. Well, our fossil, yeah. Did, did I see on the top of uh, on, the, on top of his like snout? Were those actually like nostrils? Yeah, yeah. Oh uh, no, those are those are uh, his eyes. The, it did have nostrils on the top though, and uh, this is was a fish like like lungfish that could breathe air, it could breathe the, either above water or underwater. So that was not a problem. Okay. Yeah. Question. About um, three minutes ago, you showed what they were searching for. While you're answering the question, in a, in a rectangle. Oh. How did they know that there was a critter at that location? They didn't. They hoped there would be one. They had the right age material, and uh, they also and they they had the right environment. Those had, those had been done. That had been done from previous. Uh, Previous studies of the area. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. The question was, how did they know that he, they'd find uh, Tiktaalik there? Like I say, they didn't. Um, the fact is, they could have gone a little closer to home, somewhere in central Pennsylvania. Rocks of a similar, of the same age, and uh, yeah. Ted showed me some of the specimens that he'd collected in central Pennsylvania. Uh, near Red Hill or at Red Hill, same thing. I understand the age and the rock material, but why did they think a new species was going to be there? Why did they think a new species would be there? They didn't know. It was, it was you, you're looking for something in the right place. You're hoping to find a transition. You know that you have these before things and after things. Let's you know. Let's hope we can find a transition. That's all. Thank you. Knowing nothing about it, would yeah. it be that there were some species they'd seen prior to that and one after that, maybe? So they knew what age of sedimentation. I don't know how much earlier material and later material they found at that particular locality. Never seen that yeah. discussed. Yeah. They probably saw older fish somewhere. Oh, yeah. Older oh, yeah. Well, I, as I say, they had the right age because, you know, the, the, pale, the paleontologic record is well is really very well known. Oops. Sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, it's not advancing. Okay. Back up here. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah. What, what was <laughs> what was the question? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. I was wondering. Um. You know, you said they had to remove uh, material off the uh, the remains of the bone structure. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it was encased in stone and absolutely no. It was it was in shale. Yes. How did they? Yeah. What did they have to remove? They had to remove 
some of the shale. Shale is relatively soft and it's easy to distinguish from the bone underneath. Okay. Well, the question, are fossils merely replicas of the original things? Many of them are, of course, but many of them aren't. Uh, this is a fossil, certainly. Uh, 42,000 years old, deserves to be a fossil. This is a woolly mammoth, or maybe not so woolly in this thing, because hair is one of the first things that disappears. But uh, uh, this was uh, a one year, uh, a one month old female uh, woolly mammoth that came from northern Siberia that had been frozen for forty two thousand years in uh, permafrost. Anyway, you know we find things like this; they come up all the time. Here's another one. This is a uh, a bison, an extinct bison. By the way, extinct doesn't just mean dead. Extinct means that that species no longer exists. Uh, well, this is an extinct bison. And uh, it was found during um, hydraulic mine operations for gold uh, in northern Alaska. And it came down to University of Alaska. And this is uh, uh, Dale, uh, uh, let's see, what's his name? Um, I can't think of his last name right offhand. Uh, it was it took, took uh, basically the interest in it and possession of it. So it stayed in the University of Alaska's freezer for a couple of years. What do you do with this? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> eat it? <laughs> well, yeah, that's what they did. So uh, basically, he and a few friends uh, sliced off some of the still looking very frozen meat that had been frozen for more than 50,000 years plus two, because this was two years after they found it. And uh, they put it in a pot and uh, added a lot of carrots and potatoes and onions and uh, a lot of garlic and wine, I don't know, they probably added the wine in other ways, but I'd need a, a lot of it, <laughs> uh, and, and ate it. And they said that, uh, you know, it smelled and tasted very much like uh, like beef and uh, with a slight uh, earthy uh, flavor. Uh, so anyway, anyway, he's still alive because I, I was in contact with him just about a week or so ago, and he thought he loved the slide. And uh, yeah, but he, he had to say that because uh, yeah, after all, I'm seven months his senior. He's retired from Alaska. Okay, uh, <clears throat> these are bellumnites. Bellumnites, uh, I collected these from a stream bank of Cretaceous muds in, in, in New Jersey. And uh, Judy in the back there wearing this necklace. <laughs> uh, there she is. Um, <laughs> The, uh, you know, she, she needed a, a Christmas present, so I made a necklace out of them that I co collected many years before. Yes, what is it? Um, yeah. What causes um, particular species to go extinct as opposed to another? I'm sorry, what, what, what causes it? Oh, uh, well, uh, it depends on the species. Species either evolve into other species or they die out for some reason. The, the, the reasons are endless. I we could stand up here for, and recite a whole bunch of possibilities. But uh, an, an individual species uh, typically lasts only a couple million years. I mean, that's typical. And, uh, you know, so basically this is actually useful, useful to know, too, because you know exactly what time, you know, wh where these came from, the time that they came from. But these are belemnites. Belemnites are the supporting, the internal supporting structures, rods of uh, ancient squids uh, like this. And uh, the um, now this is original material. They were solid rods of calcite, mineral calcite, calcium carbonate uh, at the outset. And this is the same calcium carbonate. Nothing's been added or subtracted, which makes this stuff very useful. You know, it's original material. Now, oxygen, most oxygen is oxygen 16. 16. That means the atomic weight is, is 16 atomic mass units. Um, but there's also a small amount of oxygen, 18. It's all mixed together. And uh, for most chemistry, the chemical reactions and so on, nobody knows the difference. They act the same, almost. The fact is that the ratio of O18 to O16 will vary with the temperature of the environment. And uh, from that, we can tell that these belemnites, like temperatures, ocean temperatures, they're squids, uh, between 55 degrees and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So what good are fossils? They tell us how animals live. What temperature bath water are they like, for example? These guys are, are lowering a, uh, a steel um, pipe, a three-inch pipe uh, with a plastic liner 
uh, or shipboard and it's going to go down and they're going to drive it into the sediment, the soft sediment on the sea floor there, quite far from land. And uh, what they'll bring back is a vertical sample uh, in the pipe and within the, the, uh, uh, within the liner, uh, a vertical pipe that has the, uh, uh, the sea floor at the top and older sediment layers underneath. And you can see layering and so forth. But basically, uh, in the open ocean where this was collected, uh, the rate of sedimentation, rate of accumulation on the sea floor is very slow. Uh, first of all, you're far enough from land that you don't get much mud and other stuff washed in from land. And um, the, the rate of sedimentation on, in this case would have been around a centimeter per uh, thousand years, not very fast. And what does that sediment consist of? Mostly microscopic organisms, the shells of microscopic organisms that are part of the plankton upstairs in the water column uh, that are made of calcium carbonate, you recognize carbonate again, it has the oxygen, you can do the O18, O16, and basically uh, you can determine past seawater temperatures. Now, uh, that particular core, that, that core was a short length of a larger core. There, we have better, uh, newer things that go much deeper than that. Uh, basically, this is the record that we can see based on oxygen isotope uh, measurements uh, going back half a million years, that's 500,000 years. And you see the temperature has gone up and down by 12 degrees or so. And when it goes down, those are continental glacial periods. And those little little peaks that go up are the interglaciers, interglacials like what we're having today. And of course, we're making it even more of one by global warming. <clears throat> So again, you know, this is this is important information, and this is from fossils. Uh, well, Jersey City, um, I, I never had much of an inclination to go looking for fossils north of the Arctic Circle or anything like that. Uh, but um, I did, uh, Dad and I did go down and walked along the beach at um, the uh, on the south shore of Raritan Bay, near the entrance to New York Harbor, and. Basically, I collected some interesting things. The reason I went there was because uh, that green area is Cretaceous, the outcrop of Cretaceous sediments. That is to say, Cretaceous time, the Cretaceous period was uh, the uh, third of three periods that had dinosaurs. They were the last of the dinosaurs. So, uh, you, any fossils that I found there would be Cretaceous age fossils living alongside dinosaurs. Well, these are were marine sediments or marshy sediments or whatever that we're looking at. And going along, there was a sort of a, a, a small sea cliff there. And weathering out on the beach, uh, I collected uh, three vertebrae. Um, and whether these are dinosaur vertebrae, it's possible, or they may be from a swimming reptile. There's not enough good information. The preservation isn't good enough to tell. But uh, definitely they were uh they were living alongside the dinosaurs and they were probably, it could well have been marine reptiles. Uh, another place I like to collect was in South Jersey because my my grandparents lived in South Jersey and I'd go up to several towns, probably you wouldn't recognize them because you live in New York. But uh, uh, I, one of the place, kinds of places I like to visit were, uh, were glauconite pits, pits that were, were the green sand there, green sand pits where the green sand is a mineral called glauconite. Deposited, it accumulates on the sea floor, and uh, the seas had covered this area when the, that sediment was deposited. And uh, it, this, uh, the age of this stuff is, um, is, is Cretaceous. In fact, the end of the Cretaceous, the end of the dinosaurs, corresponds pretty much with that little ledge that you see there going right across the, you know, the, uh, the top of the, of the darker green. Um, so, so you, I can go there and collect marine fossils, and I collected that one day. I came back with uh, several alligator, or not alligator, crocodile vertebrae. Crocodiles like salt water, and those plates on the on the left are are dermal plates. They're some of the armor on the back of a crocodile, and the the teeth down below are uh, uh, sharks' teeth. Remember, this was underwater. This was a seawater, and the one on the on the southeast. Since I don't, I have a pointer, but people at home wouldn't be able to see it. I'll just describe it here. Here it is close up. Now that's a brachiopod. A brachiopod looks very much like a clam, except it's not very closely related to clams. 
but the point is that this it's it's a bivalve that is it has two uh, shell halves and they're hinged. Uh, the hinge is right up there near the uh, near us. Well, it's a brack. No, okay, I told you that. But it's a um, uh, but it, the art, I like the specimen because even though it's uh, you know <laughs> sixty five uh, million years old, the hinge still works. I have this in our attic and I can open and close it. Uh, the hinge still works. And the last time this guy yawned at us would have been 70 million years ago. Many fossils are replicas. That is that you don't have the original material. You can have all degrees of, of replacement or, or uh, from raw material, the actual material to uh, complete replacements. A lot of you probably have been to uh, a petrified forest, uh, national park, I guess it is now. And uh, some people say, oh, look, these trees have turned to turn to stone. Well, trees don't turn to stone. They uh, get replaced by mineral matter. And that's what's happened here. These trees have been replaced by, uh, by quartz. That's SiO2, silica, uh, silicon dioxide. And we so the term is silicified. They've been silicified. They've been silicified because wood actually uh, has a, is, is attractive to silica. The silica would be in the in the groundwater, and these logs had been were buried in uh, in sediment that was water saturated, and the, in the water you had a lot of dissolved silica. Well, as I say, the silica has an affinity for for a cellulose and for a lot some other uh, uh, organic materials as well. So basically, the silica would coat the uh, the cells both inside and out with uh, quartz. Quartz is silicon dioxide. It's crystalline silicon dioxide. And uh, then the in interiors of the cells and so forth would likely fill in later. And the organic material, original organic material, can very well at that point be lost. Where did that silica come from? The, uh, that part of the world was uh, uh, had a lot of active volcanism at the time. The, the trees grew and the the sediments they were buried in were there. So the sediments had a lot of, of uh, volcanic ash, which under the microscope looks like this, little tiny particles. This is a, an electron micrograph. Um, and, and, but this stuff, the, but volcanic ash uh, is highly silicious. And the, this, the form of the silica, it's quite soluble in water. So the groundwater that these logs were buried in was rich in dissolved silicon or dissolved silica. And uh, as I said, that was available to fill in the spaces. This is a specimen that we have in our living room. It's about three feet across, a slice of that of that kind of, uh, of wood. You can see the the uh, ring growth, the growth rings, and so on. But the and the color, by the way, quartz is quartz is glass clear. But uh, the color is due to impurities of iron and manganese mostly. But around the edge, I noticed just within the last year, even though this thing has been sitting in our in our uh, living room for a long time, uh, noticed, oh, look at that stuff, which I thought of that as being just uh, uh, mineral staining. No, I think I'm, I'm convinced that's charcoal. Basically, this tree burned. That is to say, it survived a forest. Well, it didn't survive the forest fire. It was killed in the forest fire. Uh, and you can see that black there on the edge. That's where the, the wood has been singed. And subsequently, the charcoal was simply engulfed by uh, silica. And uh, so here we have it. Those are sil silicious pebbles of, on the outside that were part of the surrounding conglomerate that the log was buried in. The reason I say that I think that that the tree must have been buried by the, must have been killed in that forest fire is that there was no new growth uh, you know, no repair growth coming around on top of the charred area. Um, that's a rare find, by the way, and I didn't know I had it until I started looking at it. The um, so, uh, other things can get solidified. Uh, marine organisms frequently. These are corals, those are, are tan colored things in limestone. Now, limestone is made of the mineral calcite, which is fairly soluble in water. And uh, but the, uh, the, 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 the corals, those things that you see standing up there, those corals were, um, were somewhat solidified. Silica is very insoluble generally. Once it turns to be, once it's in the form of quartz, uh, uh, the mineral quartz, 
which is what you have here, uh, it's very insoluble. So basically, you could throw this thing in a pot of hydrochloric acid and come back in a couple of days, and you wouldn't have any of that uh, matrix. You wouldn't have the limestone. It would all have been dissolved away. You just have a bunch of corals lying around like ice cream cones. Um, now, where, did the, where does the silica come from them, for them? Um, seawater doesn't have much dissolved silica in it, but there are organisms, abundant organisms in the sea that extract the silica, even though it's at low concentrations in the seawater, they extract the silica and build their skeletons. These are microscopic organisms. Some of these are diatoms, which are single-celled plants. They photosynthesize. They have chlorophyll they photosynthesize. And uh, they're a very important uh, constituents of the world's plankton. And the um, starry shaped thing there, that's a, an animal, one cell animal, the, uh, I'd say, a, a, a radiolarian. Both of those uh, organisms, types of organisms secrete silicious uh, skeletons, if you will. And, uh, but, uh, but of a sort, a form of silica that uh, is in itself highly soluble. Uh, another organism, sponges. You've heard of glass sponges. Maybe you've seen them. They're really made of the same sort of stuff. They extract uh, silica from seawater and precipitate it as spicules, as, uh, as stiffening structures in the, uh, in the sponge tissue. Well, those also are sources of silica for other things because they go into solution and that, that, that's, that silica then is available to fossilize whatever is around. Let's do an experiment. Here we, I call it opal. Opal is the, uh, is the form of silica that these organisms uh, make their skeletons out of. So they precipitate opal. That's a, uh, a form of, of silica. Well, put opal in a pot of water and it'll partially dissolve to an extent of about 130 parts per million. And those are the, you recognize the silica bouncing around in there. And you have equilibrium as many leave the, the solid as are reattached. So basically it's equilibrium about 130 parts per million. And in another pot next door, we put in a, some, some crystalline quartz, which is much less soluble. So it equilibrates at about eight parts per million. Now we connect the two pots. What happens? Well, we get a mixing, of course, and uh, at, a, uh, at a rate that is less than 130 parts per million. So it's undersaturated with respect to opal. And therefore, uh, we have uh, 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 the opal, and you have, net, you have dissolution of the opal. It, it puts more silica into solution. And meanwhile, it's more than eight parts per million, which would be equilibrated for quartz. So basically, you have precipitation uh, of silica on the quartz. On the on the on the crystalline form of, of 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 the mineral. All right. Well, basically, what you have here is a chemical pump. You're pumping. Uh, you know, it's it's like a siphon. You're you're taking mineral the, the substance from the opal, putting it into a less soluble form on the quartz. And if that quartz is replacing other tissues and so forth that uh, in the uh, nearby uh, uh, nearby sediment, uh, that's how you can solidify fossils. Uh, silica is a very important type of, of uh, uh, fossilization, but uh, you can replace uh, organic matter with a lot of other minerals. Uh, pyrite is one of the favorites, and it's very pretty. Actually, this is another piece of, jewel of Judy's jewelry, but uh, this is a, uh, the, the organism you see here is, uh, a, uh, uh, is an ammonite which is the closest thing we have it have to it today is the pearly nautilus coiled thing. You see these in gift shops and so on. And uh, it has internal divisions. You can see those partitions within the cell and it's, it's a spiral thing. And you'd have te arms, tentacle-like things coming out the, the uh, aperture there. Pyrite is shiny, uh, uh, brassy type, uh, brassy luster material. So uh, you, in fact, I've seen, as I say, you can replace organic matter with all, quite, all kinds of, uh, of minerals because organic material, as it sits there rotting, uh, it, it affects the, it changes the, uh, the chemical environment in its, in its immediate environment. And that can cause the precipitation of whatever happens to be available in the local groundwater. <clears throat> in fact, uh, 
I uh, was shown in the Amer in the uh, National Museum many years ago. I was shown a, 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 a an amphibian bone, leg bone of some sort, of, of a giant amphibian, an ancient thing, of course, about this long, about this fat, that was lying there, was dead black. And the reason it was dead black is it had been replaced entirely by uraninite. That's black uranium oxide. It would have sent a Geiger counter up the wall. But uh, anyway, so that was fun. But, uh, at, uh, you know, the other, I showed you just a, a uh, something that had been replaced by pyrite. Uh, these plant plant fossils had been pyritized too, but uh, pyrite, iron sulfide, that in, when it's exposed to weathering uh, can rust. And so what you have here, a little rust uh, remaining things. Plant remains in this particular specimen are just are black. Now, what is why are they black? They're black because uh, they're they we say they've been carbonized. That implies that hey, you've added carbon, turned it into a fossil. No, that's the original carbon. Uh, plant material consists of you know about fifty percent carbon and the rest of is mostly hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen and oxygen get distilled off over time under you know, uh, pressure uh, conditions in the uh, under burial. And what's left is dead carbon. Carbon is black. Uh, we know this. Soot is black. And uh, you know, you, you, you know this. The frying pan gets black after all, enough for organic carbon gets left on it. So these plant are plant remains. What's interesting about this particular specimen, I didn't collect it. Uh, this was given to me by a, uh, a, a previous co uh, a colleague, and uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, Don Siegel, who uh, also is happens to be a recent past president of the Geological Society of America. Anyway, he collected this in Montana and uh, uh, gave it to me. What is it? It's an inch thick layer of kind of funny stuff that doesn't look anything like what was above or below it. This layer can be found worldwide. This is the fallback of the pulverized debris that was blasted out of that enormous crater that formed when a gigantic meteorite struck Yucatan uh, 66 million years ago and caused the end of the dinosaurs and uh, lots of other things too that are less well known. So basically, this is the fallback of that material, not just the material that was blasted out of the crater, which was big, like 60 miles across or something like that, but, uh, uh, but also of the meteorite itself. The meteorite, I think, was something like six miles across, big thing coming in at many thousands of miles an hour. Okay, so I know exactly those plants died that day, 66 million years ago. Okay, I said... You don't always have the body of the, of the organism. Uh, these things are <clears throat> trilobite burrows. You know what trilobites are? Um, most people do. I'll show you one in a second. In fact, there's one up here on the table. The, um, in fact, I think it's the one, one I've got next view. The, um, these are trilobite burrows. And uh, you say, well, they don't look like burrows to me. They look like bumps. Yeah, that's because we're looking at the underside of a layer of sandstone uh, these burrows were made in the underlying mud on the seafloor, uh, and then were later filled and then covered by the uh, by the sand, which is now sandstone, kefir sandstone in central Pennsylvania. And um, you look at these for a while, and you're, okay, here's a trilobite. It's the same one that's on the desk up here. You can look at those later if you want. Uh, this is a trilobite. The, the genus is Calimini, and that could actually, it's the right age and so forth. This could well be the same the same uh, genus that made those burrows. Um, now, how can something that looks like that make a burrow that looks like what we were ju just showing? The um, trilobites got legs, lots of them, and uh, but they're hardly ever preserved, with rare exceptions. There's a world famous unit over just this side of uh, Utica, in the Utica shale, black shale, um, that you see as you drive along the throughway and go through that part of the country, the black shale is the black Utica shale. And there is a thin layer, a thin bed, not very continuous. It's only an inch or so in thickness that is rich in trilobites. It was brought in there by a sort of underwater mud flow. And um, as a result, the, the trilobites that it contains came from a shallower depth and got moved into deeper water. And then they were, uh, that, that explains why half of them are right side up and half of them are upside down. 
just like these two here. But what is especially beautiful is that the soft parts of these trilobites are preserved in what? Pyrite. So these have been pyrotized and they were, again, in infinite detail, the interiors and so forth of the, of the animals and their legs. And you can see how if they wiggle their legs a lot like this, they could make burrows like this. That's the same picture as before. Other trace fossils, as they call, as we call them. Uh, here's a dinosaur footprint. I collected this in, in Connecticut again when I was in high school. You know, as I say, Dad was very accommodating, and uh, you know, I organized uh, what I call the Connecticut Valley Expedition because I knew a lot of the rocks up there contained fossil dinosaur tracks. Well, here is one. That's about this long. And this uh, this is another one I picked up there, which was a dinosaur tail trace. Now those are very rare. Not if you look at old pictures of dinosaurs, they're always dragging their tails. You wonder why they didn't wear out. Well, for the most part, they the tails were above ground. They were sort of like rear end balances. And uh, so there aren't many tail traces, but that's a tail trace of a dinosaur and this thing that kind of where his heel went right across his own tail trace. Uh, you know that that actually is a footprint. Not very clear though. Other things lead trails. Uh, these these trails were made on our beach at Ocean City, um, where damp damp sand. Little clams, about half inch in in length, uh, were actually moving around on the sand. I watched them do it, making these little trails until they find a good place to burrow into the sand because that's where the sand, the clams live. Um, but all right, could we ever find these in the fossil record? Here are some that are four hundred plus million years old. Central Pennsylvania. And this was collected, uh, I collected it uh, just south of Route 20 here in central New York. Uh, those swirly marks were made by an organism that basically started, had a vertical tube, and then basically came out of that and basically swirled or, you know, swung around back and forth on to, uh, to make a sort of uh, the sweeping motion that you see here, turning the sediment as he went. And it's even given a name, Zoophycus which I almost wanted to put in, in, in uh, quotation marks because it, the zoophycus, we don't know what the, or, the, the organism, as far as I know, has never been found. It was a soft-bodied organism and left no trace of its own body, but it left its trace in terms of its activities. Notice now, these are, are these fossils? Yeah, well, sure they are. I mean, they're, they're, they're evidence of, or, of past organisms and of what or past organisms did. Down at the low, uh, low tide level, often on, our, on the beach, you find little concentrations of black material like this. And uh, that isn't, those aren't just dark minerals. Take a closer look, so maybe a slight greenish or brownish cast to it. A little closer down, looks a little pelletized. Those are fecal pellets. A clam's got a poop. And so do other invertebrates. And uh, so basically in great abundance, here they are and they get concentrated by the, the, the waves that are moved around and so on. And uh, Judy and I uh, sort of whimsically call them poop de los invertebrat, our, our, our purposely fractured French. Would you ever find those uh, in the fossil record? You know, they're soft things. Well, wait a second. This, notice what the, this is the Jamesville limestone. This library is the DeWitt Jamesville Library. This specimen, this is a thin slice seen under the microscope was collected, so it's a piece of limestone, was collected within a mile of this of where we're sitting. And those things are all fecal pellets, the shell fragment going across in the middle. And, uh, you know, see there, they're very small, but about the same size as what we were looking at on the beach. Yeah, you can see that. And larger organisms do larger poops. Uh, we all know that. And uh, this was uh, a, a from a mammal, an early Cenozoic mammal, post dinosaurs, but I don't know the exact age of this. Uh, Don gave me this one too. I'm not sure if he was kind of give me a message or not, but uh, he, uh, you know, I, my guess is that it's probably Miocene in age, uh, you know, something on the order of, well, I don't know how old it is, somewhere after 66 million years anyway, when the dinosaurs all died out. But people study these things. It's not just, hey, look, fossil poop, ha ha. It's, um, you know, these can be dissected. Now by dissected, it's not like doing a, you know, what an owl burps up, uh, you know, uh, owl pellets to find out what they ate. Uh, 
but you 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 carve these up for the same reason. This, of course, is not soft anymore and doesn't stink. Uh, this is mineral matter now. But if you slice them, you can very often find remnants of whatever its meals, the last meal was, whether it's bones or organic matter of, of some other sort, you know, vegetable matter. And uh, so this is, this is actually a legitimate area of study. Okay, we have some interesting things uh, that have happened, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the paleontologists have come out with, but they also leave uh, eggs. Dinosaurs laid eggs. All dinosaurs laid eggs, as far as we know. And of course, dinosaurs uh, were are the ancestors of birds. That may sound strange if you are not familiar with it, but that in fact is the case. Some people in classification sense say that birds are dinosaurs. And uh, that's okay. Kind of hard, you know, the dinosaur roosting in our maple tree. But uh, anyway, they, they, they laid eggs just like birds. And uh, it, th these were collected uh, uh, by uh, uh, a, uh, a, a geologist who basically then became the, uh, the director of the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, but uh, 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 Roy Chapman, Chapman Andrews was his name. In the 1920s, he led a couple expeditions to the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. Not my favorite place to collect fossils, but he did that. Nobody else had ever been there. And uh, he was the first person to come back with, uh, with dinosaur eggs, of what you see here, that of course then got displayed in this display in the Museum of Natural History. And in that same unit, there were lots of bones of Protoceratops, which is the dinosaur, a small dinosaur you see here. So, uh, but there were also, uh, interestingly, some bones of another species that had not yet been described. Uh, and, the, and reasonably enough, they said, okay, well, he very likely was trying to steal some of those eggs. And uh, so we'll call him uh, uh, Oviraptor. Uh, Oviraptor means uh, uh, egg sealer. And uh, that was, again, sort of exciting. The only trouble is recent, more recent work has shown that, no, Oviraptor wasn't eating those eggs. Overraptor, they belong to her. And uh, so uh, uh, anyway, there's Overraptor and he's, she's been exonerated, but unfortunately she'll have to live with her name, meaning egg stealer for the rest of her life. Sometimes we, all we have are molecules. Now, dog knows about that. Uh, you know, this is like a, uh, a, guest, uh, a guest book for uh, some place you go to visit. And uh, but uh, of course, there's no animal there, no, you know, nobody there except a fire. Well, we think it's a fire plug. The dog comes along and thinks it's a, a you know, a signpost, a, 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 you know, a visitor's log, and uh, he sniffs around and he knows who, who's been here and what condition they were in and all that stuff. And then he pees on it himself. That's leaves his own his own scent. Uh, by the way, they never come back to smell their own then after that. But uh, anyway, uh, so this the, they're just leaving molecules that belong to a previous visitor. Okay. Working on that same principle, there was a, tank, a team from uh, Scandinavia who investigated a, a place, did, did a very fascinating study up uh, on the northern tip of Greenland. Um, now, um, the, um, this, this study is particularly interesting because it was published only two months ago in the journal Nature. At, uh, in, in December, this is December of last year, this study uh, came out. It was really, really groundbreaking. Basically, they, uh, they went, went up there and sampled uh, what was still frozen um, uh, sediment that they knew had been deposited on the floor of a, an estuary, in other words, in, under marine conditions. But now because of tectonic movements and so forth are elevated above sea level so that they could sample, they didn't have to dive to get the sample, sampled this, this mud. They weren't looking for organisms. They didn't get any bones or anything like that out of that sample. What they did was, uh, was look for the uh, biomarker, bio, uh, biomolecules that were left behind that might have been, that might have survived. Now among those, I mean, we're talking about things like DNA usually in fragments, fragmental DNA, but it had survived, even though these sediments were 2 million years old. Um, 
pieces of DNA and proteins and various other organic molecules uh, that then could be matched to various kinds of organisms that they knew must have existed there. Well, for one thing, you get horseshoe crabs, you know, there's a marine setting and all, and, and other marine organisms, Not no problem, no, 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 no surprise. But also they could find out what lived in the surrounding land because animals, again, as we all admit, uh, poop and pee. And that stuff goes all over the place in great abundance, and it contains the, uh, the molecular signatures of the organisms that did it. Now, that stuff attaches, those molecules attach themselves to sediment particles and can get washed off into adjacent waterways, like this estuary. So from the studies here, you know, this is more, more familiar to biologists, uh, you know, bio, um, uh, biological research than it is to paleontologists, but this is coming in now. Uh, and uh, even though these sediments were 2 million years old, they were able to determine that uh, the, uh, the landscape around there uh, had mastodons, those elephant-like things, mastodons, uh, reindeer, you see them in the background, geese, uh, extinct types of rabbits and hares, an extinct beaver, um, what else? Oh, all kinds of things, an extinct bear, an extinct coyote, and, uh, uh, and, a, <laughs> and this is a real winner, a, uh, a, a giant, uh, a, a giant uh, Arctic camel. You don't expect to see camel. You think they belong in the Sahara Desert. There were giant uh, camels in the in the Arctic when this was uh, at, at that time. The sediments were deposited, and their DNA and other chemicals washed off into the into the estuary. And of course, they also got plant uh, information about the plants, not so much from those biomolecules as from the fact that the plants uh, produce uh, spores and pollen, depending on the plants, and that all get washed off, and they're very durable. They can be found in ancient sediments very easily. Now, I, in my write-up that was supposed to attract people, I, uh, I said that some of our buildings in Syracuse were uh, made, uh, literally made of fossils. That goes for our city hall, which you see here. Um, if we took a, this is made of Onondaga limestone, locally mined. Some of it are probably in, uh, uh, in the precursor to the, well, the what, what is the uh, the prison quarry uh, in Jamesville, and um, you know, some other local sources. But anyway, that, that limestone is made, literally made, of the little calcite, calcitic uh, plates that make up the skeleton of crinoids. Now, crinoids, that looks like a plant. In fact, it's an animal, and it's related, closely related to starfish believe it or not, the, uh, and uh, most of them were pretty sedentary. They had to hold fast, or, you know, so they didn't get blown or washed away and stuff. They're marine organisms, and uh, there's several heights, several inches, something like that. They're all, they were all different heights, and arms and so forth. Well, anyway, they're made mostly of calcite with just enough organic material to keep them alive and to keep the, those plates hanging together. After the animal dies, the soft material decays and drops away, and you're left with a heap of little platelets like you see there on the right. Um, they get washed around again and eventually get cemented, re-cemented by, by, uh, by more calcite that gets added between them. Those are the, that's the blocky stuff between these darker pieces. Those darker pieces are, are all crinoid fragments. This is seen, of course, under the microscope in an ultra thin slice thinner than you, one of your strands of hair. Um, so basically, if you dissolve, if you somehow magically dissolve all the crinoid fragments that we have in Syracuse, uh, all your half the buildings would fall down. Um, also in the, oh, here, this is, this is that limestone after it's been weathered, the surface has been weathered by rainwater and so on for a long time. The old buildings, you see this kind of uh, features on the, in the, in the building sides. The, gran the, gran the grainy stuff that you see making up most of the rock there, those are crinoid plates cri or crinoid fragments of various sorts, columns, whatever. You can study those if you like. Anyway, the, the reason I, I show you this one is because also in the, in the Onondaga limestone, which this is, uh, we have corals. These are 
these aren't reef corals. These are corals that grew as individual corals, sort of in like an ice cream cone with internal radial partitions. Uh, there again, they stand out a little bit better. Why? Because they're silicified or partially silicified uh, and they resist weathering. Now let's jump real quick, take a, a quick uh, leap to uh, Nevada. And in Nevada, the rocks are very different. The layers of rocks, you know, oldest on the bottom, younger ones on the top. And they don't look uh, much like what we've got here in Syracuse. There's no way you could trace a layer of Onondaga, the Onondaga limestone across the country to Nevada. Uh, but uh, we know that this particular, what's called here the Dene limestone, is the same age as the Onondaga, our Onondaga limestone. How do we know that? because it has the same fossils in it. And fossils, again, any particular species just basically doesn't hang around very long. They, well, they're on Earth for a couple million years at most. That's the way it usually happens anyway. And uh, it's not just because you have corals there. Uh, you know, <laughs> corals like this, sort of like this, lasted for, you know, for a long period of time in, in the past, but different species. So we're talking about the same species of coral and uh, they, they're the same ones that we have in the Onondaga. So we judge that the, those units are the same age. Now, this can be done globally. So that it allows us, for the first time, basically to, to correlate uh, time, time equivalence between rocks in vastly separated parts of the world. And this, of course, means then that basically, since we have layers and layers, and we can follow these through time, and we can make these correlations, we can begin to put together a history of our planet. It's amazing. It was amazing discovery that that this was so that that uh, that uh, uh, that particular species, fossil species, could be used in this way. Uh, well, is this new information? No. <laughs> William Smith discovered this back in the early 1800s. And, but that's the basis, for example, for the chart, the time chart that probably most of you have seen one time or another or tried to ignore if you could, uh, that basically we divide up the, the geologic past uh, by its fossils. This is the way this chart was made. This was, the chart would have, the, the different periods of time grouped together into larger units, eras, and broken down into epochs. Uh, this is, a uh, uh, the chart that basically time chart with its name uh, was essentially completed by the end of the 1800s. Essentially, hasn't changed, and uh, but uh, we've learned a lot about it. Uh, the you can go finer than just saying okay, something is Devonian in age, like our Onondaga limestone, uh, because because that in turn is broken down into much smaller units, these various epochs and stages beyond that, and there's our Onondaga limestone. So we can place that very, very, very nicely within the Devonian. Well, nobody knew how old any of this was. But clearly, how old is a rock? You look at a rock, it doesn't just speak, speak and tell you its age. It's not written on it. But fortunately, rocks contain uh, datable minerals. Many of them do. And uh, one, uh, and uh, this is basically, the, I'm talking about the kinds of radiometric dating using radioactive minerals and their rates of decay uh, to determine how old a particular rock is. Once you know that uh, uh, the rocks containing a particular fossil are a certain age, then you know that everywhere in the world, that's the age they had. Well, okay, so we get some ages. There are tons of ages, we have everything dated, but you know some of the main boundaries here in millions of years uh, that became not known, and that surprised even, even geologists. They knew the Earth was old, but they didn't know it was this old, and it's actually much older. That fifth, 570 million years in this nice detailed chart uh, above it has that detail because 570 million years ago, that's about when you started getting multicellular large organisms that were big enough to study and so on. Before that, you know, basically the world was populated by microorganisms. Can I ask a question with that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so my sister's um, partner mines her car diamonds for his living for like 10, 15 years now. So when he mines her car diamonds, like what one of those epics or stages or periods most likely is, is what he's like hammering into? You know, I uh, Herkimer diamonds. This question about Herkimer diamonds and 
uh, you know, what ages, uh, ages they are and this sort of thing. Uh, I don't want to answer your question because I'm not absolutely sure. It's Paleozoic. And, uh, but beyond that, I'm not sure the exact, exact placement. I think that it's an early Paleozoic, uh, but I'm not just sure. And I, I, think, I think possibly the, the limestone is actually Dola stone. That means limestone with a little extra magnesium. Um, I think that's, uh, I think it's, I think it's Cambrian, but don't quote me. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the crystals of quartz that you're talking about that we call Herkimer diamonds are, uh, are in cavities that were dissolved out of that limestone. And so the, and then the crystals were deposited later by groundwater. Uh, and I don't know what their age, their age would be younger, of course, than the host rock. Uh, the distribution of fossils is also very important. And you learn a lot from them because, you know, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the plants and animals that inhabit uh, North America are different from the ones in Europe. Of course, that's all blurring now because we're mixing everything. But, the, uh, but in the past, that wasn't, wasn't so. Um, the glossopterous assemblage, named for the plant that you see there, leaves of that plant, uh, about uh, 250 million years. If you care about names, that would be a sort of boundary between Triassic and Permian below it. But um, I, 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 its name, the Glossopterus, is that, is that plant. Uh, associated with Glossopterus, uh, or the Glossopterus flora, because there were other components of it, were this mammal-like reptile, uh, Lystrosaurus, and uh, it was about five feet long, I guess, and Mesosaurus, who was a swimming reptile, but he lived in fresh water. He couldn't cross an ocean. All right. So where do you find that assemblage? It was long known from South America, also then from South Africa, which in itself is strange. How did they get across to communicate basically same species, species that can't cross uh, an ocean like the South Atlantic? And India, same assemblage. Australia and Antarctica, something screwy about that. All right, let's put the continents back in the position that they had in the days when the, that fauna was, uh, fl flora and fauna were uh, existed. And there it makes sense. This was one of the strong arguments many years ago for continental drift. And that's exactly what's happened. Uh, this giant con continent, we've uh, assemblage of continents, giant continent that we call Gondwana and Laurasia up above with parts of North America and so forth on it. Um, these were, uh, these were, those continents were together as this giant Gondwana landmass. Um, and uh, since then, they've floated to their proper conditions. Floated is a bad word. They've migrated to their proper positions. Okay. Well, we all have ancestors. And you say, well, okay, we have dinosaurs. Here's Stegosaurus back in the Jurassic period, early, you know, middle of dinosaurs' reign. And, uh, you know, of course, I mean, we had, must have had ancestors then. So do we have people, not necessarily dressed up in, in suits and ties, but um, the, uh, and the answer is, yeah, we had ancestors there. But then I thought you said there weren't any people back in the uh, in, in, in dinosaur days. And I, yeah, I said that. No, uh, our ancestor at that point looked like this. It was a little animal about that size and uh, uh, but basically, this is uh, the the root root stock for all the mammal uh, mammals that are going to be descended from them. Uh, so not only is he your and my great 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 great, great, great you can supply all the greats you like grandpa or grandma, uh, but uh, he's also the great 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 grandpa grandma of uh, of giraffes and aardvarks and mice. These were all mammals that came later. Well, okay, so let's let's review. What good are fossils? They're beautiful. They tell us about creatures we'd otherwise never have known existed. They tell us how animals live. They tell us ocean temperatures across pe past ice ages. They tell us how animals ate and pooped. They help to confirm continental drift. They let us match ages across great distances, ages of rocks across great distances. Mm -hmm and they include our ancestors. Well, none of this, of course, virtually almost none of this was known 200 years ago, but there was a guy who, uh, who anticipated it all. 
and in fact, who laid the, uh, who, who basically um, uh, brew, breathed the, uh, breathed meaning into biology, all of biology, not just modern biology, present day stuff, but ancient biology as well. And that man, of course, that genius was Charles Darwin, who will turn uh, 214, 214 on next Sunday. I'm done. <laughs> but I'll glad to take questions if we're still on the air, if we're still doing something. <laughs> yeah. There is a kind of a rhetorical problem. I understand a way around it, but I want to hear what you have to say for kind of superficial discussion. If we use fossils to date rock structures, and we use rock structures to date fossils, how do you avoid the charge that it's such a circular argument? It isn't circular because we're using different methods. Um, the fossils are just basically something, I mean, you know, a, a, a uh, something stamped, you know, you can number the the, the, the uh, units, the rock units, if you want, doesn't matter. Basically, they're indicators of a particular age. We don't know what age. The age, in terms of years, is determined, as I say, by radiometric means. Now, young things, like if you have uh, just a few thousand years old or a few tens of thousands of years old, up to maybe about 50,000, you can use carbon-14 dating. And, uh, but that, that, uh, again, is only for stuff less than about 60,000 60, years, very young stuff. But that would include, for example, the bison that I showed you and that uh, uh, the woolly mammoth. And uh, but the uh, uh, but uh, for older things, you have to use uh, you use other other methods, uranium and lead uh, in various minerals like zircon and so on that happens to occur in the rock. The way that works, again, I don't want to go into, into great detail here, but, but uh, for example, if a volcano erupted while that sediment, that layer of sediment was being deposited, so that you have fresh volcanic ash, let's say, from the volcano, and it's in, the, in that bed. All right. At the, no, at the time that the crystals or anything that's in that, uh, that volcanic ash was formed by by the time it when it cooled, um, you uh, basically freeze into it certain mineral uh, certain uh, isotopic ratios in some cases mineral ratios like uh, like uranium that will over time turn to lead at a known rate, and uh, so the more if you have lead uh, excuse me if you have uh, uranium in a mineral like zircon that's a beauty for that uh, because and when it forms, it will accept no lead in its crystal structure, but it always will accept uranium, and that's almost always present, even minute amounts. Uh, over time, internally, within the crystal, the uranium is slowly breaking down to lead, and you can study the ratio of those two, knowing the half-life and so forth of the process, and you can determine the age. It has nothing to do with fossils. Uh, so, But once you've dated a fossil, then you know, okay, this species of fossil is a particular age, and anywhere I find it, that's, a, that's its age. So basically, at that point, you can start dating the rocks by the fossils, simply because you know the age of the fossil. But without the radiometric methods, you wouldn't know. But it, see, it isn't circular. We're approaching from two very different directions. Is there, is there like a one-sentence way of formulating that? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Bryce? Yeah. You showed a picture of a uh, uh, coelacanth fossil. Wasn't that the fish that was discovered first in fossil form and then later found alive? Yeah. Can you? Yeah. 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 I, I will. The question is. Uh, uh, here we uh, the, the coelacanths. Remember that uh, early one that I showed you that the guy wanted to uh, to uh, keep in the museum. Um, the coelacanths were first known from the fossil record, uh, but then they were discovered around Madagascar, and then it was in fairly deep water. Some fishermen had brought up these things, and they were obviously living there. And uh, they've, since then, they've been found in a number of places. I think there are three species known, and they're 
go over into the Southwest Pacific too. But um, uh, yeah, and they were they were found uh, uh, living. Now somebody would say, well, wait a second. Hey, we got a living fossil. No, they're not living fossils. They're just as derived as anything else as you and I. The um, the the coelacanth actually the coelacanth i don't i don't know for all of the all three species but the ones i'm familiar with are about this long typically something like that this big around much different from the one that i was looking at totally different not only different species but different genera uh but they are in the larger group coelacanths and uh, they share an awful lot of stuff but um uh yeah so they're very different and uh the things that are called quote living fossils aren't really living fossils they're as derived as as anybody else anything else any other organism uh it's just that they share enough characteristics of the of their forebears that uh we can oh look they're, it looks just like well no they don't but i mean you can tell them apart if you're if you're good at it and the things that are obvious may not be the things that change most so people can make that kind of statement Other than looking for uh, rocks of the right age, but it, is there anything else that the leader researcher can look in a particular area of a particular fossil? For instance, the the transition rocks. Is there anything else that one should look for besides the appropriate age rocks and appropriate environment? Well, those really are your leads. As I said, uh, a material similar to this with similar, I'm not sure they were identical species, have also been found in Red Hill, Pennsylvania. and uh, Ted showed me a lot of the material that he was working on that were still in, you know, in drawers. And uh, yeah. So yes, uh, uh, there, those, those, those are the two main things. I'm not sure what else you, uh, well, you might, there, yeah, there, there would be other things, although it's part of the environment. For example, if you knew the paleo environment, the environment at the time was, you know, in the Arctic or something, and, and you have something that lived on the equator. You know, you pay attention to things like that. But, uh, so the kind of, uh, like, you, you wouldn't just decide to go to the Arctic and look for a particular fossil because you knew the right age of rock there. There would also have to be other things, other environmental factors. I can't tell you all the reasons that uh, the team went there, but they were, they again, you know, the, the two key things, the, uh, the, um, the kind of rock and the age of the rock, and they knew it was fossiliferous from previous studies, people who had mapped the geology there just as units of rock. Uh, and uh, they thought it would be, they have actually uh, spent time there on several successive years, occasions. The, the field season in that part of the world is not very long, and it's not very comfortable either. And once you're dropped off there, you're on your own. I mean, there aren't any local stores or anything like that. You just have an arrangement that in so many days, helicopters are going to come and either supply you or take you home live or dead. <laughs> yeah. I had a question, like, in terms of, like, determining, like, um, layers of, like, of the, like, any kind of, like, um, material. How do you take into account of, like, uh, erosion and um, with, uh, decomposition or... How many hours do we have? The question is, how do you how do you deal with uh, the, the the problem of rocks get eroded and uh, and other things deposited on top and all kinds of things like that? Is that the substance of yeah yeah um, yeah? Basically, you have to realize that if if the set in a sedimentary sediment sediment sediments and sedimentary rocks, of course, are have been laid down one on top of the other like so, and uh, the uh, um uh if the if the uh, if these rocks haven't haven't been disturbed that's the way you'll find them but in many cases you see rocks have been tilted like this by tectonic forces in the earth during mountain building activities and things like that and uh then of course up is over uh, strata you know time up or stratigraphic up is let's say in that direction um the um uh, and in fact, in rare cases, they can be overturned, but it's always obvious that structurally this is what's happened. Um, so you don't uh, you don't find these things out of order, or if you do find them out of order, you you can usually figure out pretty quickly why they're out of order. J.B.S. Haldane, 
a prominent biologist of the early part of the uh, uh, of the 1900s uh, was once asked, well, you know, uh, tell me, what would it take you to uh, to to decide that evolution wasn't true or that evolution didn't occur? And he'd say a rabbit in the Precambrian. OK, or a person, a human being in, you know, you know alongside T-Rex or one of these other dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you never find those, those those kinds of anomalies. They simply aren't there, and uh, we all understand why. We find our ancestors, but our ancestors weren't people. They were other things that didn't look like people. Hi. Thank you so much for all your efforts throughout the day. Do you know if there's an excitement of species not yet even discovered, or is it pretty much believed that once you, once you've been yeah, are, are we, are, are, are there likely species that haven't been discovered yet? Absolutely. Most of them haven't been discovered. I think it'd be fa almost fair to say. Uh, we're most familiar with big things like giraffes and alligators, but uh, they're undoubtedly, I mean, the, among the smaller things and insects and birds. And yeah, I mean, they're all, and it's certain you get into the microscopic world. Yeah. An, an awful lot has not been discovered, and of course, in the fossil, uh, in the fossil realm, only a tiny fraction of what used to live is available for inspection today. Yeah. Have you ever found fossils in locations where it didn't seem possible that they should be? I'm thinking of situations like um, natural disasters or hurricanes, tornadoes, things of that nature that in the past might have picked up material and moved it to a location it shouldn't be. Well, uh, this uh, little lump of siltstone that I held up with its fossils in it, uh, in effect is, the question was about uh, fossils. Had I ever found fossils that were just in the wrong place that didn't belong, you know, didn't belong there? In effect, that's what this is. This is a pebble. This pebble uh, was uh, uh, didn't actually form on the sea floor in northwestern Pennsylvania, where Dad picked it up and brought it over to show me. Uh, <clears throat> it was uh, uh, probably not transported very far, but it, it was moved to, into place by the last glacier. I don't know how far, not very far, because you have things of the right age, of this age, uh, a short distance to the north. But this has been transported. And uh, if you put a, a pebble in a stream, it goes a long way. In fact, uh, I showed you one of my slides. I don't know if this is, I uh, know it's not, a, okay. But the, um, uh, this, this trilobite is one that I found very much out of place. Uh, it was on the bottom of a, uh, of a current, of a, of a, of a stream. Uh, I used to like, when I was in college, I used to like to run around through the woods that the college owned called Glen Helen, and uh, just for fun. And the, uh, you know, I was jumping uh, literally uh, step stone, stepping stone to stepping stone, going across a small creek as wide as this room, uh, not very deep, maybe this deep at most, uh, going along and the rough surface, of course, was ripply and all. And as I jumped from the next to last, well, you know, <laughs> a couple boulders, I looked down and, and landed on the far side of the creek. And I thought, did I see what I thought I saw? It looked like a trilobite. But I don't, no, no, it can't have been. And I almost didn't go back, but then I did go back, and here he is. Beautiful trial bite. You can look at him up close if you like, but it's, yeah, it's, uh, so yeah, yeah, things, yeah. All right, so was it in the right place? It was in the wrong place in the sense that, no, that didn't date the creek. That's a pebble that washed in from ex exposures of that age rock, Silurian age rock, further upstream and was brought into in the place. Yeah, hi, do we have a technical problem? Yeah, I have a question from the online viewers. Before oh. letting you know what the question is, I wanted to mention there were as many people watching on Zoom as there were in the room. And afterwards, you got many, many thanks and congratulations for a oh. good talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Every is as far away as Northern California and Wisconsin. So the question from one of them was, if you have any thoughts on the debate regarding the end of the Cretaceous mega tsunami. Do I have any questions? This is from a reader, uh, from a, uh, 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 someone who listened in on, on Zoom. Um, 
Do I have any any thoughts about the what was it about the dating of the impact or about the debate regarding the end of the Cretaceous? Okay. I guess no. Yeah. Uh, about the uh, do I have any any thoughts about the importance, I guess you could say, of that impact? Did it was it totally responsible for the dinosaurs? And uh, well, I, I think that if we my 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 frank uh, opinion is that uh, that if that impact hadn't happened, we would have dinosaurs running around today. And uh, so in that sense, we can thank the the impact. Uh, nothing would have happened the same as it did as it in fact has happened. Uh, by the way, I, I I was at the uh, uh, at ground zero. I was at the impact site right in the middle of it uh, many years ago on a field trip that we we're, were studying uh, looking at the groundwater with the uh, the uh, Geological Society of America meeting. It was a field trip from there, and uh, I went along to Yucatan at the time. Nobody knew about the impact structure, but we were interested in the uh, a double ring of large cenotes or uh, sinkholes, water-filled sinkholes uh, around, you know, in, in that area. And one of the, you know, in the discussion, you know, the, the plausibility of a buried impact structure came up. Well, that's exactly what it was. It was the impact structure, uh, Chicxulub. Uh, it was the town, but uh, Merida was close to it, and that's where we stayed one night, two nights. Yeah. Right, same question was about a mega tsunami. Oh, okay. Well, that would have been, yeah, there definitely was a mega, the question was about the mega tsunami. <laughs> By golly, you don't crash a six mile uh, meteorite at, you know, Hyper hyper speeds <laughs> into the earth. It created an, an initial uh, hole, a crater that was miles deep and many miles across. That was the initial structure. Because then it collapses and does all kinds of. We've drilled into it since then. In fact, they had drilled into it previously before anybody figured that's what it was. And I have the I have the log of that uh, of, of at least one of those wells. They just didn't know what they were looking at. And it's interesting to read the descriptions of this funny stuff that they were finding, you know, and they interpreting as best they could as more pun in more mundane mundane uh, explanations. But yeah, I think yeah, I, but that produces an enormous wave. And that wave, uh, definitely, it, it produced underwater landslides all around the Gulf of Mexico and even the eastern seaboard. Uh, and uh, it, uh, uh, yeah, and the much of the United States at the time was actually submerged, was underwater, about half of it was. And yeah, definitely, I would not have been wanting to be standing anywhere near uh, yeah, uh, including some of the evidence that has been found in, I think it's North Dakota. That's a long way from Yucatan, southern Mexico. Yeah, it went all over the place. <laughs>